Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And I do hope you're doing exceedingly well. Lots and lots of love to each and every one of you. And don't forget to go and get that hot beverage, because even when the weather gets warmer, a hot drink is very, very soothing. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Anka and I'm from the Bay Ridge neighbourhood which is on the southwest corner of New York in the borough of Brooklyn where I initially lived with my husband in a very attractive multi-unit red brick pre-war apartment and this picturesque apartment was where I actually raised my two children when they were young before they finally left home to begin lives of their own. My incredulous outlandish Bigfoot encounter happened in rural Georgia in Gordon County on a holistic retreat of all things, quite simply the last place I would expect to encounter the elusive hairy man. My strange, incredulous, bizarre story begins when one day out of the blue, with no forward warning and no negative signs of anything being at all wrong, my husband of 28 years announced casually over the breakfast table in a nonchalant way with an air of indifference that he wanted a divorce. I remember I felt as if I'd been hit head-on by a forklift truck. It was as calamitous for me emotionally as any life-changing event invariably is, like a major car accident or a devastating tragedy. In an instant, my whole world came tumbling down like a building in the throes of demolition, one brick after another, leaving behind a whole heap of chaos. I was that heap of chaos. Did you hear me? piped my husband. I want a divorce. I remember my hand began to wobble unsteadily on my cup of coffee, and I began to tremble. But why? I protested. I don't understand. We've been together for almost thirty years, and have raised two beautiful kids together. I thought we were both happy. I'm in love with someone else, said my husband, and I want to spend the rest of my life with her, and not with you. It's as simple as that. In that moment, I was more than a little stunned. Why had I not seen this coming? Was there something I'd missed? Why had I not seen the warning signs that something was terribly wrong in our marriage? Who is she? I asked, holding my mug tightly in my hands, resisting the temptation of throwing the coffee directly into my husband's face to wipe the smug, self-satisfied, impervious look off his face. Someone I met at the office, he chided. We've been having an affair for over four months now, and one thing led to another. Four months, I gasped. This has been going on for four months. I'm afraid so, said my husband in a nonchalant way, as if he was talking about the weather. I'll be sending you the divorce papers in due course, and I won't be coming back to the apartment any day soon, except to pick up some of my stuff. I watched in horrified disbelief and dismay as my aloof, impassive husband gathered his briefcase together and then bustled out of the house in a cavalier, heartless way, getting into his jeep and driving off into the sunset to embrace his new romantic life with his brand new love. How long I sat at that table, I do not know. I was in such a stunned daze. For a while I was frankly too numb and desensitized to feel anything at all. And then I became angry and enraged and began to beat the pillows on my bed so hard that my cat Garfield, who was decidedly unimpressed by my fragile state, wisely decided to make a quick hasty retreat from the bedroom, eyeing me warily as if to say, what's got into you? For several long days I remained in my pyjamas and I slumped around the house clutching my pillow desperately like a frightened kid with a teddy bear. There were times I lay on my bed on a crumpled, despairing heap and sobbed and sobbed until I physically could not cry any more tears as they had completely dried up. I do not even know how to describe my emotional turmoil to you, as my feelings lay all around my mind like the scattered pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, and I was powerless to put the pieces together again. How could this have happened, I wondered? How could our marriage of twenty-eight years be over now? How could my husband decide all of a sudden he didn't love me any more? None of this made any sense at all. How could you just switch off your emotions like a tap and cease to care about someone any more? 
I then began to ask myself all kinds of questions about my husband's mysterious lover. Who on earth was she? Was she much younger than I was? Was she prettier than me, I wondered. All those disturbing, tormenting thoughts whirled around in my mind like the flying pieces of laundry in a tumble dryer. Then I knew immediately that I simply had to find out what she looked like to satisfy my heightened curiosity. So that very afternoon, still wearing my pyjamas, I got into the car and waited outside the offices where my husband worked. That was when I saw them, arm in arm, walking out of the offices together, both laughing happily and staring lovingly into each other's eyes like besotted teenagers. I gasped in astonishment. My husband's new woman was my age and was not even remotely attractive. I think the fact that she was so plain hit me harder than if she'd been young and beautiful, because I remember thinking, you left me for her. I think I was exceedingly insulted and even offended. The only thing I could conclude was that she must have one hell of a personality. For the next month, I barely ate, avoided phone calls and stayed at home taking unpaid leave from my job. There were times I felt so inadequate, dejected, despairing and hopeless that I even considered swallowing a whole bunch of pills and just ending it all. One evening my husband popped around to pick up some of his stuff as he had said he would. Look at you, he gasped. You look frightful. You're a complete mess. He said this in such a cold-blooded, compassionless way. And then I watched him gathering his clothes together and leaving the house without even batting an eyelid. That was when it hit me like a bolt of lightning. You were married to this soulless, remorseless man for over 28 long years, and he doesn't give a toss about you. Why on earth are you wasting and expending all your time and energy crying over such a narcissistic creep? That was when common sense and wisdom prevailed, and I finally pulled myself together like the cords of a wash bag. You idiot, I scolded myself. You think he cares a damn about you? Of course not. You're sitting back, grieving over a complete jerk. What is your problem, woman? Get a grip. That was when I decided to book myself into a holistic retreat for a couple of weeks, as it was a marvellous place where people could receive emotional, mental and physical healing in the Georgia countryside. I knew getting away from New York would be exceedingly therapeutic for me. I had heard about this incredible place from a friend of mine, who described the retreat as a lifesaver for her after her father had tragically passed away. I remember she returned from that retreat so radiant and full of life. I knew this was the kind of place that would indeed help me to get back on my feet. Within a day or so, I had arrived at this perfect retreat, which was an exquisite white Georgian home, surrounded by verdant valleys, open prairies of wild flowers, silvery streams, pond, rugged mountainous outcrops and dreamy forests. There was about eight of us women on the retreat and a handful of experts who were helping us through our turbulent journey of holistic healing. There was also a dietitian, a massage therapist, a counsellor and so much more. I was to discover that the troubled women at the retreat were there with all kinds of personal problems from low self-esteem, addiction, depression and so much more. And many of those issues arose from fractured or abusive relationships from their pasts. It was a radical treatment where we were given daily coffee enemas, drinking vegetable juices every two hours, experiencing rigorous massages and exposed to counselling sessions where we talked about our problems and grievances. We even engaged in bizarre rituals to come to terms with our past that sometimes seemed to border on the ridiculous, but as odd and as crazy as it sounds, they actually seemed to work. I remember the one day I was actually asked to punch this large punching bag where a picture of my husband's face was attached to the bag with a pair of boxing gloves. I was asked to pretend that this bag was my husband. I want you to show your husband how he has made you feel, the therapist told me. Express those feelings locked within you as you punch the bag. Hit it as hard as you like. Release all that pent-up emotion inside of you. You're a real turd, I said, beating the bag. How dare you treat me like a piece of dirt? I beat the bag again. I despise what you did. You made me feel like I was worthless. You broke my heart. 
I promise you that I beat that bag within an inch of its life, and I felt so much better for it. The coffee enemas were another radical, unorthodox treatment that turned out to have extraordinary health-giving benefits that I could have never envisaged possible. As gruesome as it appeared, I was amazed by this ancient method of detoxification and the putrid stuff that came out of my colon, like colon plaque, worms and undigested food that gets trapped in there for many years, was so uplifting. It would seem that this purging and cleansing of the body was exceedingly regenerating and restorative for me. We were informed that in order to heal we needed to cleanse, detoxify and regenerate our minds, bodies and spirits. And as idiosyncratic and unconventional as it sounds, it was miraculously beginning to work for me. I was feeling lighter, almost as if a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. My skin was beginning to glow and radiate, and suddenly I could see a light at the end of the tunnel of my life, as it became brighter and richer in quality. Every morning we would engage in very restful yoga sessions with deep breathing on the pristine velvety lawn, which was situated only yards away from a very tranquil, beautiful forest that consisted of statuesque pine, cedar and oak trees. One day as I was lying back on my mat, I was sure I discerned that we were being watched. It was the weirdest feeling ever, but I knew in my gut that someone or something was hiding behind the large oak tree, watching our every move, like a perverse peeping Tom of some kind. I did not express my misgivings to anyone, as no one appeared to notice or sense anything. Was I losing my mind, I wondered? Had I imagined what I perceived? I could have sworn that someone had been watching us, but why had I been the only one to sense this anomaly? As we trooped over to the table to receive our wheatgrass shots, the whole pitcher of green juice was now all empty. We looked at each other in amazement, for none of us had drunk our servings of the grotesque drink yet. The therapist looked confused. What happened to all the wheatgrass, she asked. No one could answer this curious enigma, and so she returned from the kitchen with another pitcher of juice. I got the sense that she thought that one of us was secretly drinking all the wheatgrass behind her back. Her eyes kept glancing towards Nancy, one of the clients had had addictions to just about everything. It wasn't me, protested Nancy, looking at the therapist earnestly. I don't even like the stuff. I could tell that the therapist didn't look convinced, but thankfully she said nothing. Later that day when we were given free time, either to go for a walk or take a nap or read a book. I decided to venture into the Sylvan. That seemed to be mysteriously calling me, for some reason. Words fail me to describe how exquisite this area of woodland really was, and I did wonder why no one in our group had shown any interest in exploring this enchanting spot, or just going for a walk. It's so steep in those woods, one of the ladies had informed me. I loathe walking uphill. I want to assure you that I was in wondrous awe of what I was perceiving. The tall, statuous, mature trees with their ample, burly trunks rose up into the heavens like masterful giants, and the branches intertwined from a great height, providing a glorious canopy above my head, while the sunlight twinkled through the branches and bespeckled the floor in a subtle ethereal light that created a quintessential magical ambience. There were lavish curtains of ravishing verdant moss, swathing the branches in velvet green carpets, and even rocky outcrops were dappled with this green fairy magical dust. Then amidst the sculptural rocks were fanned out lacy ferns, wild violets, creeping junipers and periwinkles, and so much cascading greenery of which I could not identify. I noted that the forest became steeper as I climbed ever onwards and upwards on the hilly rocky incline where the rugged earthen trail zigzagged precariously through this woodland stretch, supported by naturally formed rock walls that provided stability for the steep ascent. I could hear the pretty tweets and warbles of the songbirds and noisy yet soothing crashing sounds of the water from the stream that meandered through the valley below. Before long the ground evened out and I was on a flat expanse, and as I moved ever forward, once again I sensed that I was being watched. It was not a pleasant feeling, and I wondered if the peeping Tom from our yoga sessions was hiding out here in the woods and spying on me. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing on edge, and I knew I needed to head right back because something was distinctly off. 
As I clambered down the rocky paths, I sensed the creep behind me and could hear his heavy breathing. If that wasn't bad enough, this creepy stalker was following me closely and was clueless to my awareness of his presence. I was terrified that he was going to emerge from the undergrowth and pounce upon me. My imagination perceived that this weirdo may be some kind of psychotic killer. I mean, I'd seen enough programmes on televisions about strange men hiding out in woods and attacking unsuspecting targets. I did not want to be another victim. I walked slowly, and as I moved, so did this man. And when I stopped, so did he. I turned around, briefly scanning the area with my eyes, but I saw nothing. It made no sense to me. My mind was racing. Should I run? Should I walk? Should I call out to the stranger and let him know that I was fully aware of his presence? I reached out to retrieve a stick from the ground and began thrashing it as I walked. This way I would show the creep that I was not going down without a fight. I whipped the ground very hard and the stranger behind me began to flog the ground. I was stunned that this man had the audacity and the nerve to mimic my movements. Finally, I'd had quite enough, and I spoke out. Come out! I know you're there, and I know you're following me. Show yourself now. The forest grew strangely silent, almost airily still, and I heard nothing. But instead of walking forwards, I turned around and began to look behind the trees. I was not going to let someone get the upper hand, I thought angrily. Suddenly, the bold, courageous, valiant warrior... Within me surfaced, the fighter that had been suppressed and hijacked for so long by a subservience that had monopolised and controlled me during my married life. I had forgotten that in my core I was tough, strong and determined, and there was a side in me that I had long since forgotten that was being reawakened and energised. I know you're there, I called out, wagging the stick in my hand forcefully, and I'm not taking any nonsense from you. All of a sudden I saw a movement, and then I saw him. I knew at once that he was the mythical creature known as Bigfoot. I could hardly believe it. I have no way of describing what I felt at this moment, as astonishment completely overwhelmed my sense of understanding, and completely subdued and repressed any feelings of fear that I might have had. I was so gobsmacked that I just stood there staring at this critter in total and utter disbelief, with my mouth hanging open and my eyes growing as wide as saucers. What I was perceiving seemed so illusionary and so way out of the realms of our reality that for a moment I needed to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming, as this experience was so surreal and phantasmic. The Bigfoot was about seven foot tall, 500 pounds and three foot wide across the shoulders, and was slender but burly in its width, with very overlong arms and powerful taut muscular legs. The critter was covered with long flowing light brown hair. I noted that the dome-shaped head of the critter appeared to seamlessly fold into the shoulders. It didn't have a neck to speak of. The face was exceedingly boyish, with a very prominent brow ridge, very flat wide nose, and deep-set green-brown mischievous eyes. But what amazed me the most was that the critter was so human-like, it was almost unfathomable. For a second the Bigfoot began to mimic what I had been doing moments earlier by lashing the ground with a stick. I just stood there watching him emulate my previous actions, just too bewildered and stunned to even respond. The Bigfoot pointed to my stick with a rarely naughty twinkle in his eyes, and I realised he wanted me to thrash the ground, like I'd done so before, as if we were playing some weird kind of game. For some reason of which I cannot fathom, I obliged him, as the mischievous spark in his eyes I did not desire to refuse, so I horsewhipped the ground, and then it was his turn, and he began to lash the ground with his stick, and this cycle of lashing the ground went on for a long while, like one of my therapy sessions, and then we both began to laugh. I think his laughter was more like a snort, but I could tell he was highly amused and really enjoying our game immeasurably, and in a strange way, I was also having a great deal of fun. All of a sudden, I heard this high-pitched whistle coming from further away, and the critter perked up 
and I could visibly see a very disappointed expression upon his face, as he didn't want to leave our game, but someone was clearly calling him. The critter looked into my eyes, made a chattering sound of a few words, pointed to the woods with his overlong arms, as if to say that he needed to go, and disappointed I watched him glide into the woods so fast, like a rocket going off. I have never seen anything move that quickly in my life. When I returned back to the retreat, I told no one what I had seen, but I thought about that Bigfoot all the time, and he made me smile. In the days that followed, I could sense during our yoga practice that we were indeed being watched, and I guessed that it was the curious, very inquisitive Bigfoot that I had encountered in the woods. This was confirmed during our session, when during every yoga practice, three acorns were thrown directly at me, and I would giggle and wave towards the wood green and throw three acorns directly back at him. I knew he was saying, hello there. I now emphatically believe that the Bigfoot I encountered was actually a juvenile who had a taste for wheatgrass. It would seem the pitcher of green juice was always emptied, and I'm pretty certain the Bigfoot was the perpetrator of this mysterious crime, but I never said a word. I was hardly going to give my hairy friend away. I even heard the therapist on the phone calling up the kitchen. I'm afraid Nancy's been at it again, although she's not coming clean. But I know it's due to her addiction problem. She has it worse than I thought, and she's clearly still in denial. Can you send another pitcher of wheatgrass to the table, please? Fast forward a few weeks, and I returned to my home in New York, and for the first time in my life I felt energised and refreshed. I rarely believe my strange, rather bizarre encounter with a Bigfoot brought out the fighter within me, that had been vanquished for so very long. I began to approach life very differently, with a renewed spirit and a sense of purpose, and I would wake up feeling very happy with my life. One day my husband came to visit me and begged me to take him back. I could not believe his blatant audacity. He had thrown me to the wolves, and now he wanted me back. That was never going to happen. You dumped me, I reminded him, not the other way round. It was a mistake, he told me. A big mistake. You said you were in love with the woman and wanted to spend the rest of your life with her, and you didn't care a jot about how that made me feel at the time. You were brutally insensitive and callously cruel. I was just infatuated, he explained. It wasn't love. I thought it was, but I was confused. I don't care what it was, I told him. I was married to you for over 28 years and I don't want to waste another minute of my time with you. When you walked out, you showed me what a spineless loser you really are. I want nothing more to do with you, but the divorce papers would be very nice, thank you very much. My husband looked completely startled. But why? I don't understand. We were together for 28 years. You don't want me back? That's what I told you when you left me, I reminded him. And no, I don't want you back. It's definitely over. My husband looked so shocked. You really have grown cold and hard, he said. It's called getting a backbone. I'm not a doormat anymore, I told him. I watched him storm out, and that was the last time I ever saw him. I heard he lives on his own now, with a shepherd dog, and people say he looks miserable and lonely. All these years later, I'm a very happy woman, and although I've never remarried, my life is incredibly full, and I do believe that Bigfoot that I encountered sparked a renewed fighting spirit within me. I have listened to all kinds of Bigfoot reports, but I am glad to say mine was more on the congenial side, but I can see why many people would be terrified of the critters, because they look fearsome and intimidating. In my case, I was just simply too shocked to be afraid. So there you are. That's my story. What an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.